Hi, my name is Carolina and uh, I am here at a beautiful uh, Purple Valley Yoga Center together with Katie Cooper. Hello. Uh, very happy to have you here. Thank you. To, I'm honored. Yeah, and to so. have the opportunity to practice with you. I have been following you for a very long time and when I wrote to you last year and invited you, I was delighted over the fact that you said yes. Uh, you. you are a very long-term senior practitioner, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but first, we or you wanted to start with uh, telling us a little bit about your morning practice. Yes. Yeah. So this morning at 5:30, yeah. I started, and I had a beautiful second series practice. Strong, flowing. It's always breath uh, uh, moved at this point where I just get into this beautiful space of flowing on the breath. But it, it reminded me anew of how well this practice works yeah. for me and how enlivening it is and the joy I feel in practice. So uh, as I um, said the other day, it wouldn't be fun for me if I was trying to run after it at this stage of my life. I'm always questioning if I should make some changes, but so far I feel like it, it gives me everything so I don't feel a need to change my practice. So, um, yeah, so I came in to teach feeling very energized and alive. And the one ingredient that makes a big difference for me is getting enough sleep at night. I really need eight hours of sleep if I'm practicing and teaching. And that, there, there you have it. That's my uh, main formula. Yes. Um, starting with discussing your practice, I wanted to mention to you all that uh, Katie is today going towards 72. Oh, you have just no, I just turned, turned 71, so well, we don't hurry that along. Okay, <laughs> and, you, and usually, usually we do not discuss uh, a lady's age, but in this case, I actually wanted to do that because for me, you are a great source of inspiration. When I'm your age, I <laughs> honestly hope that I will be able to practice and to teach and to be like you because you are just filled with vitality and energy. Great. Uh, so I actually wanted to take it a little bit back in time and perhaps we could start when you started your practice. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I started in 1976 on Maui, Hawaii. There were no yoga mats. I always like to say this because to this day I cannot remember when they first came in. And uh, we didn't have a shala. So David Williams and Nancy Gilgoff had just brought, moved to Hawaii from California and uh, began accepting students here and there. And so I was ta initially taught privately by Nancy in a park next to the harbor where people were walking by and through the entire time. And uh, did you know about uh, David and uh, Nancy before, before you came no, to Hawaii? No, the whisper. How did, it, how did it start so like, what in happened? the beginning? Right. So what was exciting about this was that I had known I'd wanted to do yoga. I'd moved to Maui. I was practicing Richard Hittleman's 28-day yoga book. That was, there wasn't much out there, and there were no yoga centers or shalas in uh, Hawaii that I knew about. So um, the word, all of a sudden there was a whisper. There's these two yogis who've come from California, and they've been, they learned in India. So there was this whole mystique, because that was unheard of at the time. 1976, or maybe it was still 75. No, it was 76. So I was very intrigued, and I'd already made um, some plans to go back to California for a while. So I went back and very quickly did a turnaround and came back. And then uh, chase David around a little bit when I'd see him in the grocery store to say I really wanted to practice. So after a few months, I was invited. And it was $50 for the month. I had to come six days a week, and I couldn't be late. And I learned the first salutation and the, the three finishing postures, the lotus pose, Padmasins. Then the next day, I learned uh, the Surya Namaskar B. So it just built up very, very slowly. and. By the time I was in Bhuja Pidasana, upside down in the park with people walking by, I can always still remember seeing their feet. We had a shala. Somebody had built out of that kind of, I don't know what you call it, kind of those trees that are kind of junk trees that grow. 
and plastic on a dirt floor. And so began practicing with other students. And uh, once I knew primary series by heart, I always like to say this, it wasn't a matter of having perfected Marichasana D. I still needed help to not fall over. But once I knew it by heart, I was started on second series. So within two months, I had pretty much learned primary and second series. And then for two years, I practiced primary one day, second the next. It was never too much forward bending, nor was it too much back bending, and my body unlocked. It was very amazing. And David and Nancy, um, after four months, were heading back to spend six months with Guruji, Kapitabi Joyce, and David Swenson, who was 19 years old, came to replace them. I'll never forget that because he was so playful. We had so much fun. And how, how, how old were you guys? Sorry to I was 28. You were 28. Yeah. So, um, right, so I started at, at 28, yeah, or 27, 20, 28, I think. And um, so it was just great fun. So after six months, the people that I was practicing with, pretty much the same core group, who, which included Danny Paradise, everybody went their own ways. There were no cell phones, there, were, there was no internet. People didn't even call long distance because it was expensive to call long distance. So I think I wrote two letters to one of the people. And then, so what David and Nancy said is, in two years, you come back, and I will teach you advance. Now, none of us spoke to each other. We all arrived within a week of David and Nancy starting to teach, none of us having communicated, we all showed up. So that was how important it was and how we took that. Um, you know, we took David's uh, instruction and we all jumped in. And so for the next five years, I don't know how long it took me, we did, we learned all the series. But I think I learned them all within about two years. So Nancy was learning the advance with us. David we would be practicing his advance. We'd be teaching all the other students. That's how we started teaching. And I think he would give us instructions. And then uh, we, David would teach us. So what he did, he started me in third series, which, well, was really advanced A, so it's really three and four. And he began just putting my body through all the motions. So he, he did it all for me. I didn't even know what I was doing. Exactly. I was just being put in these poses. And it took, after a few months, my body emerged with a practice that I knew by heart. And so I think uh, Advanced A, as I call it, was the most thrilling practice I can even imagine. Not only was the concentration amazing, but because I had unlocked in my body, I could do everything. I just got stronger and stronger. So it's a whole practice about strength. And it was like a love affair. Everything else, my life revolved around that. But I had no injuries throughout that whole learning time. Uh, I really couldn't work much other than teaching in the morning because it was just too strong. And fortunately, that time, uh, we had no national debt at that time, so it was very easy to live off the fat of the land so we could live quite simply and do our yoga every day. And that's what we did for years. And I, I always like to say this. We would start with three of each salutation, no standing poses, no primary or second series for five years, only advanced every day, six days a week. At that time, we didn't even honor moon days. That came a little later as... Uh, Nancy had been teaching for a while, and she brought them in. It was kind of a novel idea <laughs> at the beginning for us. And how, how many students were you in the beginning? There was a core group, uh, though some people had learned some in Encinitas also. But there was a core group on Maui of about 10 of us. 10. And maybe a few more filtered in and out. But it was, uh, by the time we got to this place, the Deva Farm, we were upstairs in this big barn. There were a lot more students who were learning primary and, and um, intermediate, but they weren't in the advanced class. 
So there was a core group of us. And I think a few people who were living on other islands would show up. And I, I have a great story that I had forgotten uh, to tell it, it in Bali that I had wanted to. So I'll, I'll share it here. So I had friends who were into abundance consciousness, and they couldn't understand how I was so happy living so simply. So they wanted me to sell cookies to go to this event with this man, Leonard Orr. Leonard Orr became the founder of uh, rebirthing, which is this breathing technique. But he had been in his bathtub in Texas doing these breathing exercises that he was figuring out. And Babaji, the, from, I forget exactly where he was from in the Himalayas, he was the, the Babaji that um, didn't die. He would just appear every now and then and disappear again. And he had like seashells mm -hmm. on his uh, foot pad that you could recognize this was an identifying mark. So anyway, Leonard Orr was told by Babaji to come to India. So a few years later, I'm sitting in this room uh, where I'm going to be selling cookies at the break, and I feel this energy come right into my third eye, and I'm sitting there going, wow, this is really interesting. So he comes up to me afterwards, and he goes, what do you do? I said, I do Ashtanga yoga, and he goes, well, who's your teacher? I want to meet his te your teacher. So David, it was at the time, it, we didn't have much of a social life. He was quite reclusive, but he came, and they a little bit bantered back and forth. It was almost like I, I don't know, two teachers a little bit competing with each other. It was kind of odd. So then David invited them to come to a class. So all of them had shaved their head. I think there were six women and him. So they came and sat, and I think the women had these turbans on. They're all dressed in white. They're sitting there, and we're doing our practice. Just their being there on some level inspired me. So two things that I hadn't been able to do, I had a breakthrough in that day and was able to do them. And then from then on, I was able to do it. So when they got up at the end, he was shaking. It was like, I don't think he'd ever seen anything like what we were up to, right? And did he start to practice? No. Nobody asked me out. But I said, oh, no. <laughs> it was like, who are you? <laughs> it was just like I knew that had nothing to do with it. I was like, no. I don't think so, and I never saw him again. But it's one of those funny stories that he went on to be the main developer of what's known as rebirthing in the U.S., and he had had this connection and that, you know, he had recognized something was going on that yeah. um, would have been outside of my purview to have an experience like that. So, Interesting. You know, there's always been serendipity in this practice, mm -hmm. both the people you meet and the practice itself and the what it, uh, what comes forth from truly loving this practice. So. so let's go back a little bit to the way that you were taught this practice. Because uh, you men mentioned that you started with, of course, being taught sun salutations and the primary series. And then when you knew it by heart, do you mean memorized? Mm -hmm. when you so mean when, but by memorized, I would say at that time, I really knew it in my body. So c could you expand this a little bit? Because I know so, we had dinner and we were talking about this, uh, how your body is memorizing the... So we were taught in a different time. So it wasn't a matter of coming in and doing an hour worth of practice and then saying, okay, once you know these many poses by heart, then uh, you, know, we, you can go on from here. So nowadays people are asked to memorize them so they can keep moving forward. So because I had gone to school, I was always a good student, and I had always memorized everything, I found it incredibly refreshing when David and Nancy said, oh, no, your body will come to know. We'll just tell you until you know. So again, it wasn't a large group. So they would just say what was next. And pretty soon, I knew the movements in my body. And I found it so refreshing because when the body knows, then the mind can know. And that's the way as a, I was a Steiner teacher for years, and that's how he recognized developmentally that children learn. So it was an unlearning in a way. And um, it, it was amazing. And again, it wasn't that I had to memorize, know any certain part in the primary. They just kept giving me poses as long as I had the energy. But it was once I knew the order 
by heart, which is in my body by heart, is basically the same thing. Then they began sharing second series with me. So, that's so the series were divided already into two, very, into two different series? You had like primary series and you had also second series at that time? Or it was taught? No, as they were taught. No, it was two different uh, series. But at first, I can't quite remember how this went. I think I just started adding on some poses. But it wasn't that I did all of primary and, and, and quite a bit of second before it was divided. It wasn't like that. What all I re it was so long ago now that what I can say is um, it was even in learning it, one day was primary and the next day was second. So it, it just went back and forth. So I can't remember if I did half of primary and then started. All I remember is getting to TT Vasana and I stayed there about three weeks. It took me, that, that <laughs> asana <laughs> wore me out for a while. And then after that, no, it's just like the legs, all the energy, you know, when you put your, the last part of it and your heels are together and straightening your legs. I thought my legs were going to fall off for a while. I have been in some postures for seven, eight, nine years without yeah. managing to. Yeah, yeah. Get so the this posture. was like, so this was only a matter of months of practicing. So my legs, I think my legs went through a total reshaping within a few months. And I don't remember being tired and sore particularly, although I do remember having to take a nap here and there, and I don't think I had napped in my adult life. But every now and then I'd be like, I think I have to go to bed right now. But it wasn't that I was hurting. I might have been, you know, a little bit uh, sore in the practice while I was doing it. But I don't remember going about my days feeling that it was too much. But it was a warm environment like this. Yeah. It really helps to practice in a warm environment. And the other aspect of it was from the beginning, for some reason, though I had no previous breath training, I, although I'd done some rebirthing, but it wasn't the same breath, I felt this incredible connection to the breath and the bandhas from the beginning. So I was always um, deferring to paying attention to, my, to the breath and the bandhas. So when, when that started opening up, then I could ride on that. And Nancy Gilgoff said one time, and I'm saying this not out of pride, but she's, I never understood it really, but I'm kind of getting it now. Nancy said that I was the only person she knew who did her yoga from her kundalini. That's how she talked about it. Now, I didn't ask her what that meant because at the time that isn't what we did. But I would say I moved on the energy of the breath and the bandhas. So it, once I knew the poses and gained some strength, it wasn't my muscular, it wasn't a muscular practice. And I know anybody who has a practice over time, it goes into deeper layers. You know? So now it feels like it's a pranic practice, right? Not that I'm doing advanced. I, I can do some of it, but I had stopped when I was teaching school because I couldn't teach children all day, have a regular practice and do advanced yoga. It was not within my ability at that time. So every now and then I would do it. And so then in shalas, nobody did it the way that we had learned, which was with fewer vinyasas. So yeah, so let's get, let's get, back, yeah. uh, get back to that. I just wanted to ask you still in a primary series. Um, today when we are teaching and when we are learning the primary series, we have those not only primary, but also um, second series. We have those various postures that are like gatekeepers. Yes. Uh, Manichi asanas or Bujapind asana, for example, in case you don't get these postures, you're not basically not allowed to move on. Right. Uh, was it the same approach when you were learning this? No. In fact, I strongly disagree with that approach. I understand the practicality of it. If you have many, many students coming and you don't want them to injure themselves and you have hundreds of students in a room or I don't know how many, but you're just trying to slow it down. But I would say absolutely that was not the case. You learn the vinyasa of the, of the pose and then you would add it into your poses to, to begin to practice it. And the practice was the teacher, the daily showing up. So I never felt attached to a pose, especially in a negative way, because it was what was stopping me from moving forward. And yesterday, for instance, with Bhujapidasana, 
when we learned it, we learned it that you you jumped in the best you could, jumped your legs around your arms, crossed your feet, put your head on the ground, and lifted up. Now, as time went on and your wrists became stronger and more open, then you could jump into it however you could, cross your feet, and slowly go down with control. But to start people doing that when they're new to a practice is going to slow them down a lot because not everybody is open and strong in the wrist. So we weren't hamstrung by that requirement. So all these other poses supported the opening of everything. And then little by little, we refined it. And the other difference was that nobody was stuck, I say stuck, nobody was doing primary series for years on end without really doing any of second. So primary series has become a much more advanced series now. So we didn't do vinyasas, half vinyasas between the poses, right? We would do all three uh, Janu Shirsasanas, one vinyasa, all four Marichasanas, one vinyasa. And then the Konasanas were done in a different order than they're done now. And they, so they didn't have so many. You would immediately go into Supta Konasana, hold it for five breaths, go up to Urdhva Konasana for five, and come down into Upavista for five. And that was it. And then you jump back and you're on to uh, Supta Panangustasana. So that changed. And all these things, to me, took it a little bit out of this beautiful flow that I had loved. But, you know, that's the way it goes. And today, uh, there is also a lot of focus or attention on the drop backs. Yes. Um, basically, in case you are dropping back, you also have to come up before you start the second series. But there was nothing like this. No, not only that, second series is when you learn the back bending. Yeah. So, so the drop backs or the back bends, the drop backs were not included at all. No, no. So pe as years went on, we started doing them at the end of second series. But that would be, I have watched many people do them in very dangerous ways with not much instructions just so that they can start second series. So that wasn't part of it at all. See, that's just another way to slow people down. And the only other thing I wanted to say about primary was that many of the poses had five other extra breaths than what we do now. Supta Padangusasana and Utita Hasta Padangusasana. Before, after you brought the leg back and you came up to bow, we would then hold that for five breaths there and then release the leg and hold our waist. And Ubaya Padangustasana, we would hold back for five breaths and then come up. So things, we had more breaths in the pose. So on my own when I practice, I always do those extra breaths because I think it's a, it always feels really good to me. But it was always five breaths in the postures. Yes, but for instance, in Utita Hasa it's five breaths here, inhale, five breaths to the side. So then it was five breaths there, and then five breaths out. Some people, if Guruji determined, I can't say that we did this among with Nancy and David, but if Guruji determined that you needed more breaths, he might say, you do eight breaths in every pose for a while. If he felt somebody's breath needed working. But when I met Guruji, I already did all six of what are now six of the series. Oh, really? So you did, you have done the full thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, I actually didn't so, know that. Yeah. So when he came to Hawaii for two months, all of now the big teachers were there from America, except Richard Freeman, because he started later with us. Not started yoga, but started with us later. We did advanced yoga with standing vinyasas in between every pose. A full vinyasa. Full vinyasa. Yeah, this is standing. Rolf is teaching as well. Yeah, also but that was, only, that was only for that time. When he came back and taught advanced with us, we weren't doing it the same way. I think he wanted to see who we were and what we could do if we hadn't, um, especially if we hadn't learned from him. I think that the full vinyasa is actually giving you an opportunity to relax a little bit between the postures. I find it a little bit easier. Yeah. It's a very beautiful practice. It's a beautiful it's practice. It's a very beautiful practice. It's a beautiful yeah. practice. And by then you hope that you're strong. Yeah. When you're doing it because if you're trying to get keep your energy going, you're yeah. in trouble. The one one comment I wanted to make, as powerful as this practice is, if you push 
I believe it will break you. I think you have to keep connecting to the energy and seeing what energy you can fund to keep moving forward. And I think that's the key to a long practice, Yeah, is that you keep breathing, you keep seeing what's there, you don't drive yourself, you don't feel like you're pushing from behind to try and make yourself go somewhere. It's a celebration, really. I really feel it. a prayer, a celebration, you know, a love affair. So you want to enjoy what you're doing and be humble enough to listen to yourself because you're really developing the guru within. So if you think that you're getting somewhere by driving yourself without respecting yourself, I think that's how people end up injuring themselves. Although the teachers in the past were tougher on people. Yeah, yeah. So people used to get injured and then it would be like, oh good, now you're opening up. <laughs> Meanwhile, you need some months or whatever to recover from whatever that opening was. So fortunately that was not my experience. Yeah. So. so I mean that uh, to be able to practice, the key would be ready to listen to your body. Yeah. Every to, day without yeah. pushing. Yeah. But that by that, that but, but that perhaps would mean that you know sometimes you are going against the teacher that you are practicing with. Well, that's what's beautiful about a Mysore practice yeah. because generally, if some days it's taking more energy, it's taking a longer time through the breath or whatever to begin to open up, then you have that little more time. When you're in a vinyasa class, which has many many gifts, no taking away from that. But when you're doing it that way, you better be on it. Or that's how I think people do injure themselves mm. because they're trying to keep up with something. So uh, like, I am always ex very grateful for the way that I learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, you are 71 today and you are every day practicing. And you've yeah. been practicing every day since you are 28, which I think is fantastic because very often I hear that uh, after you turn 40, I'm almost 44, after you are 50, you know, you will not be able to practice Ashtanga. And I see myself practicing throughout my life, basically. Yeah, yeah. Me, I mean, it gives me goosebumps. That's yeah, exactly I know. how, that's exactly how I feel. And honestly, I can't know what w is in my future because I think the body does go through changes. Yes. But to point that out, throughout my practice, I never just had one diet because one diet didn't work for me. From, I, I'm mostly a vegetarian, but years ago, doing advanced yoga for five years, every day I got very hungry, and I felt like I just couldn't eat enough rice and dal to, um, I just couldn't eat enough of it to be satisfied. I was thinking about food all the time, and I was living in Hawaii where they had fresh fish. So finally, with a lot of, you know, trepidation, I had some fish. I felt so good and so strong. So I realized, for me, not every day I wouldn't want it, but I realized I needed to adapt a little bit so that I could feel nourished so I wasn't constantly thinking about food. That constant thinking about food is <laughs> now triggers to me that I need something that I'm not getting. And so over the years it changed. And as I got a little bit older, I needed different things, plus some supplementation. Superfoods are really great, spirulina and you know, blue-green algae and maca and different things. So everybody has their own way, how they determine it. And I know, you know, uh, traditionally for the Brahmins, they're all vegetarian. And overall, my partner would tell you, oh, she's really a vegetarian. But I eat fish probably once a week, and I really enjoy it. And then I feel very satisfied. But listening to the body, doing, I would get, um, I would get cranial sacral, work, acupuncture work occasionally, uh, if I felt like I needed some energetic support. So I've always been paying attention to what was going on in me so that I could uh, honor my practice. Mm -hmm. And again, that meant sometimes I fasted. The second year I was doing this practice, I fasted about 100 days of the year. Now that sounds extreme, but my experience was all my childhood illnesses came up. I had, I'd been very healthy for years. I got tonsillitis when I was young a lot. I never got them removed. So after, in my second year when I was doing second series regularly, 
I got tonsillitis. I just, I knew it wasn't a current thing, that it was leaving my body. So I just went to bed, drank a little water, and that was it. So I burned through, and I know my body unlocked also because of that. So, but I had the luxury of doing that. And I'll add one other thing about Shavasana and the inversions. And when we learned this practice, we did 50 breaths in shoulder stand. It was recognized that this queen of the poses, and then Shirshasana, the king of the poses, came at the end. And we were meant to develop and lengthen them. The first time we studied with Guruji for two months doing advanced, we did a half an hour headstand at the end of each class. So, but the one thing that I think is often lost today is Shavasana. So if we engage our muscles and we really work hard, but we do not release the nervous system, we don't receive the benefit of the practice. We don't integrate and heal. I, it's very clear to me. People get tired. They get up. Oh, I only have a few minutes. Off to the next thing. Having not surrendered. And Guruji would say, oh, many people not doing Shavasana. Because it's an advanced pose. You have to let go. So if you have longer inversions, that's also helping the breath to calm down, the nervous system to calm down. So when it's time, you have an opportunity to have samadhi in Shavasana. So I would say, if anything, people know how to go for it, but they don't necessarily know how to relax afterwards. And that that relaxation is what carries a lot of the toxins and holding out of the body. Yeah, I've noticed that in my practice that sometimes I'm extremely stressed afterwards, and basically I need to have this long relaxation session because otherwise it affects my full day at work. Exactly. Initially. And yeah. it takes your energy. You, bur you blow all that good energy you cultivated in there on the first mm. or second, whatever, activity. And then you feel tired, then you think you need more caffeine or whatever it is that you do to keep going through the day. So I'm really into the humility of what the practice demands. And so if you only have so much time, then you need to stop 10 minutes earlier or whatever, just to make sure that you have Shavasana. So I wanted to ask you two more questions. So one, how has your practice changed? Or how, yeah, how did it change through the years up till now? Okay. Your physical practice, but okay. I also wanted to talk about the more energetical practice because the other day when we were having dinner, we were talking about samskaras and how you have been working through that. So perhaps okay. we could start with the, how your physical practice has changed okay. uh, up till today and then go okay. into the other part. So I was doing advanced yoga all the time and certain circumstances changed in my personal life in Hawaii and I decided to leave. So then... I'm attempting in being in different places to keep doing second or advanced. I actually heard a voice in my head, and I've only had this happen a few times in my life. And it said, you need to stop, and you need to get a teacher. Now, at the time, because I had never actually learned these poses from Guruji, it didn't occur to me, which later I realized it could have, to have gone to Patabi Joyce in India, because it wasn't even crowded then. So that isn't what occurred to me. So what happened at that time is I backed way off because I knew it had something to do with my nervous system. Oh. I, wasn't, I wasn't in the space that I'd been in in that time in Hawaii where the energy was flowing. It was starting to become this, my mind was pushing me to do it. And I knew as soon as I got that, wow, I really got what I needed through this instruction. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I was doing my best to also uh, earn a living at the same time, and I wasn't ready. It didn't occur to me that it was time for me to start teaching. At that time, there were, there were, it, Ashtanga Yoga wasn't that well known. So it didn't even occur to me that just set up a shala somewhere, which is always, in retrospect, I look back and go, this is interesting how my mind went. So what happened was, I mostly had practiced alone for years because there weren't that many shalas. And then in moving, I started connecting here and there with people. But mostly I didn't have a, a real teacher. I would just maybe go and practice in a shala somewhere. And I was both, I was in Oregon and Washington and California, but still it was quite a while ago. 
So I would still do some advanced, but not like I had done as a daily practice for so long. And then I started teaching children, which it wasn't possible not to Not yoga? Do. No, children. Yeah, in, sc in school. I, I was a Waldorf yeah. teacher, a Steiner teacher. And during that time, because I was with children four or five times a week, I wanted to practice before I was with them. And I couldn't do advanced practice, teach children all day, prepare all evening, and go back the next day without falling over. So I started just doing um, advanced on my Fridays, say, for instance. And by that point, it was more third series because in a shala, nobody recognized what I'd been doing. You know, So I just started becoming a little more mm -hmm. in line with what was going on currently. And um, so then what started happening is that I really loved my practice. And I started getting offers to teach full time, all different situations. One place in Mill Valley, Karen Haberman had been teaching for a few years. She was heading off to India, and I was invited to teach. And I hadn't been practicing uh, as my whole focus because I'd been teaching children. So I was going to have to quit teaching children and jump into that. And at the time, I thought, hmm, I'm, I'm not ready right now. I knew that about myself, that that was what I said to myself. Later again, I'd look back and thought, think, that was an interesting choice to do that, you know, to make that choice. But that's what I did. And so what happened was, all, the te all my peers were out teaching. And what I experienced with a lot of them is they weren't, their practices were secondary. And I loved my practice so much, I didn't want to sacrifice my practice. So what I ended up doing, it was very humbling. I do my practice, and I felt like it just kept digging the same hole deeper to see what jewels were still in there for me to, to find. And what it became for me was a different journey than I could have known, which was showing up every day, practicing. The practice itself was my um, centering, my rudder in life. And all these things started coming up, latent issues that I didn't even understand a lot of it. Even though I'd done, you know, different spirit, been with different spiritual teachers during this time and all, I still didn't understand the things that were coming up. But every day I would practice. And every day I would release this <sighs> to feel connected mm -hmm. to everything. So I did that for a long time. And I'd think, oh, it's so humbling to be, <laughs> to be myself. Everybody I know is out teaching, and I'm, you know, and then I was starting to long for more of that life and more of that focus. But I just kept at it. And then when I stopped teaching children, uh, three friends of mine. Can I just interrupt oh, yeah. you? So, would you say, you know, that that practice that you were experiencing was a kind of connection with your true self? An well, I, yes, connection. thank it, you. It became, it, we, it was not only a physical practice anymore, but no. it was basically an internal journey that you were experiencing. It was totally an internal journey. Yeah. Thank you for bringing me back. So what started happening, every day I'd go, okay, I'm on the razor's edge. I'm wanting to be in balance. What is the truth of this situation? What is real? Am I making up a story about this? Uh, in my practice, how much is too much? How much is pushing it? How much is not enough? Where am I copying out of myself? So both on the physical level and how, and in life, my whole question was a question of balance. Mm -hmm. What was going on? So I began to really look at my thoughts and work with my thoughts very diligently for years. And, then, and that was an internal practice. And this is when we brought in the samskaras. Into and the that's when all, a lot of that was happening. And I worked with um, a few different awake teachers during this time. And one of them, Adi Ashanti, used to come to the town I lived in every Sunday for two hours. It was so easy. And he had a, a way of helping me to follow the truth that was directing me, to actually trust it, to recognize it. And that was a big key for me because it, it's not some ultimate truth, meaning I'm not trying to say your truth is different from mine, but what may be appropriate in the moment. It really helped me. And the other thing that he helped me with is, don't try to perfect that which isn't even who you are. You're from this time. You grew up in California. You are from a certain socioeconomic 
Don't fight that. Just know that's not fully who you are. But don't create all this opposition. I'm trying to be spiritual, but then this means I'm not spiritual. Just go, oh, well, you know, I'm a Californian and this is so. So it took the fight and the opposition out of, my, out of me. Those. And what happened then is I was able to follow what was actually there guiding me instead of uh, going to war about what I thought was an imperfect self. It was really helpful, I have to say. And again, I worked with another uh, awake teacher on retreat, and she would work so deeply with us that deep things would emerge, really powerful deep things. And I had quite a few spiritual experiences, and what I always felt, unlike some of the people around, I had done Ashtanga yoga for years. My nervous system was strong. I was ready, to, and I was able to take advantage of having really deep experiences that other people would say, I've been with so-and-so for years. How come I haven't had And I'm thinking, because you haven't done the preparation work. The inner work. So the, and the nervous system and the healing. So all of that allowed me to be ready to go through some things that were actually scary. Some people do ayahuasca and, and different things to access, I would say, this deeper, some deeper layers that we don't always know that we could access. Mm. Or as Ram Dass said, he had a brother who was in a mental institution, and he'd go there to visit him, and he'd look around and he'd go, wow, these people had the beginning of a spiritual experience, but they didn't have guidance, so they got lost. So they got lost in their mind, which I thought was a really interesting observation. So... I do feel that I had support outside of my Ashtanga practice, working with the mind, but still doing my practice, mm -hmm. right? And it was very powerful. And I finally had one breakthrough that changed everything. And it was a, it was a major Kundalini release. And it was, a, it was like something that had been held down. And this was with a guide, one-on-one, -on -one, psychotropic, but with, one, with a guide who you know, was initiated. And this whole energy turned around and came out. And he was so grounded, it was okay. And so I think for, it was almost like I had a thin sheath of glass, again, separating me from my essence. And when that happened, I think I cried a lot for a year. I didn't follow, all I wanted to do was go be in refuge somewhere. But I was living in California, and I had to earn a living, so I had to work. So I found a way to do the best I could to be nourishing to myself and to, you know, integrate a very big change. After that, that's when my life began to change in a really big way where then I was invited to come teach, and that began my whole journey to strongly teaching. And this was around, uh, you were around your 60s? No, it was before that. Before that. Um, but you, you started to teach in my time. It was, it was, I was probably about 54 or 55 yeah. when I had this experience. I was feeling stuck, and I didn't even quite know why I was feeling stuck. I had done so much work. I had dived as deeply as I could into all of my some scars that I could recognize. And during this time, a few friends of mine were working with someone who was initiated, plus was a... Uh, a non-dual therapist and had a strong meditation practice mm. for 30 something years. And so he did one-on-one -on -one with people that he determined were ready to do some deep work. And really, I did a few times, but then I realized it was really that one time. That was what I needed. And he was so grounded. Had he gotten nervous, I think I would have had a bad experience, to be honest, because I remember being really aware of him holding the ground while this whatever, emerged, <laughs> while this held down energy of my whole life somehow yeah. moved. And it was, it, was, uh, it was sort of like before and after in terms of my path. After that, I was really teaching more and more. The, the teaching of the children, I just let it wash away. So, so it's, uh, it's quite interesting because it took you approximately 30 years to start teaching properly. I mean, to basically, to, full on teach. Yeah, to basically fully dedicate yourself to teaching. And it's quite a big difference comparing to all the teachers that are being educated today. It's not that I am um, 
uh, negative towards teacher, teacher trainings, but I can, can sometimes feel that people are in a lot of hurry to start teaching without developing their own self-practice, basically. Right, so I think that a lot of times what happens is the practice suffers, and then that means their own inner inquiry gets distracted or sidetracked. So I can't speak, I think everyone is individual. Some people, they learn their first salutation and they're sharing it. It's somehow their, mm. their nature. For me, I had people ask me for a long time, I go, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that. My teachers haven't told me. So I somehow loved the practice so much, I wasn't in a hurry. But I will say this. At 60, I started going to Sri Lanka. Three different friends of mine, unbeknownst to me, told this man that owned this place and had a shala, lost the teacher, Three different people said, you should hire Kathy Cooper. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped teaching. Yeah, this is children. what I found out about you. Basically. Yeah. yeah. So that's, so I was invited to come there. So that began my real teaching. But here's what I discovered. I had already opened up. I could get out there early in the morning, do my practice. I could teach. It didn't do, it take away anything. I was ready. Now, my journey may not be the same as anyone else's, but that's how it's gone. Mm -hmm. I've had so little injury. I haven't been exhausted trying to do this work because yeah, I don't. I think exhaust. I think we underestimate exhaustion in the modern world. That's why people are so fortunate to come here and have a period of time to really ground in. And Purple Valley is good for that. Really good, and that you have two week that you offer two weeks, even though some people might come a little shorter. I think people benefit in a way that you do. You don't get the same. You don't get the same benefit no. studying with anyone if you're just there three days, right? That's how it goes. So this is important. We need these kind of places as much or more than ever. I think, you know. So just to finish it off, now I have two last questions. So today, uh, at the age of seventy-one, you are still practicing and you are doing uh, second series only. You don't well, I do a few advanced poses yeah. here and there, but I'm, I'm not, not I'm not aspiring to them no. anymore. It doesn't matter so to what, me anymore. What is the most important thing in the practice, in your practice today? To really keep my energy flowing, yeah. to be there with the breath. I'm always working on my handstands, which are improving. I went through something, lifting a heavy pot about four years ago, that really impacted my back. My back is better now than it's been in that time. So I've been working on my healing with that in the practice, mm -hmm. not just doing extra things on the side. So I love that I continue to open and heal as I need to. Like my handstand was a really challenging thing for me because I, there was a certain instability that I dealt with in my hips. I am getting better and better and better. <laughs> so that I still have things I'm aspiring towards, but at the same time to see, can I heal? Do I have to back off or what can I do? What if I show up, adapt as I need to, but don't give up? And so that's been my journey in the last few years. And the exciting thing is it's working yeah. so that I don't feel like, oh, well, I should give this up. So just showing up without an agenda and seeing how far I could go and letting that curiosity guide me has been my journey. And it's working. And that's exciting. So if anything, I would say, you know, in Karandavasana, I'm always working on Karandavasana. You know, mostly I'm doing it on my own. And so just to have control, and I've learned I really have to suck it in. It's almost like Uddiyana Bandha, even though you are mm -hmm. exhaling. What is it to really be in the energy of it so that it can move, not just muscling myself because I have big shoulders? It's a different practice that way. Yeah. So I'm very satisfied. And I leave there like this morning to come in feeling everything is flowing and I have energy and I'm ready to teach. So. Okay. Thank you so very much, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's lovely, lovely, lovely to practice with you in the shadow. Thank you. So, thank you. I'm very honored. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs>